Hello and welcome to Talking Books. I'm Jill de Villiers. In this month of Madiba's birthday and his centenary year, it is fitting to feature the latest biography on the shelves. The book is Mandela, His Essential Life, and the author is Peter Hain. A long-standing Labour MP in the UK and now a member of the House of Lords, Peter Hain has written 20 books. He is also well known for his work as an anti-apartheid campaigner in the 70s and 80s. He was born in Kenya and grew up in South Africa, and his parents were anti-apartheid activists who worked very closely with Mandela in the 1950s. Lord Haynes, thanks very much for joining pleasure, us. Pleasure, Jill. Let's start at the beginning and go to 1948 with the elections and how that changed when the National Party came in and they started designing apartheid. Yes, and Nelson Mandela was just getting involved into his stride as a young ANC activist, beginning to work with uh, Walter Sisulu and others of that generation to begin to actually prepare to take over the ANC. But it was a dramatic moment in South Africa's history, although I always point out that um, actually the origins of apartheid go back to British rule. At the turn of the, the around the 1900s, black citizens could still not walk on the pavements in Johannesburg. That was under British rule. But the institutionalization of that racist heritage was one under apartheid that created the most institutionalized system of racism that the world has ever seen. Because mm. it was bad at that time, but it got worse. Absolutely. And, and, and how did Mandela feel then? Well, it seemed that everything he did, initially non-violent direct action, he and his young ANC Youth League activists gradually got into more senior positions in the ANC until eventually they succeeded to the leadership. And they initially started off with non-violent militant direct action, rent strikes, strikes, stay-at-homes, uh, bus boycotts, and so on. Um, but the more they did that, the more repressive the apartheid state became, the more intrusive its legislative tentacles became. And it seemed as if they just weren't getting anywhere. And then, of course, they started to be locked up, banned, put on trial, like in the treason trial in 1958, when my parents first met him uh, during the lunch hour break in court proceedings and took him food to eat along with his colleagues. Uh, so it was just getting worse and worse. And how did they start working together? They were working with a lot of ANC activists in Pretoria, where my mother was effectively the chief activist at the time, especially after the uh, ANC had been banned and the PAC and the Congress of Democrats. The Liberal Party of South Africa, which was a one-person, one-vote party, different from Helen Swisman's progressives, uh, they were the, effectively the main... Uh, best known activists, my mom and dad, Adeline and um, uh, Walter Hain. And so uh, she went to his first trial in 1962 in the old synagogue in Pretoria, and he used to come in every morning into the dock. He'd turn first to the gallery, absolutely packed with uh, black uh, visitors, and salute them with an Amandla salute. And then he'd turn to my mom, who was the only white in the gallery almost every day, mm -hmm and salute her too. So that's where the, the contact was cemented. And then, um, just to truncate it, he spent 27 years in prison and the regime no doubt thinking that he would be silenced by this. But he gained in power. Yes, he did. He gained, uh, I think, the real leadership qualities that the world was then entranced by, including all South Africans, when he eventually came out of prison and negotiated to a win to create the first democratic elections in 1994 and then to win them. Uh, and, but I don't think without his period in prison he would have been able to prepare in quite that way, not just to become the great leader, perhaps the greatest of our past centuries in modern times that anybody can compare with. I think he is the icon of all icons mm -hmm. in the international political governmental world. And he was able in prison to work out his strategy to refine it, initially by engaging with his Africana prison warders, very hostile, brutal, to win their respect and to establish a basis of communication with them. And I describe this in, in the book. 
and then and also to learn their language, to learn their culture, to understand why the Afrikaners who'd been very badly dealt treated by the British, the first concentration camps, as you know, mm -hmm. were not in Nazi Germany, but during the Boer War when thousands of Afrikaner women and children were killed and died. So that grievance, that sense of uh, historic injustice burnt in the Afrikaner mm -hmm. community, he came to understand that and therefore better able when their ministers in the, in the, uh, 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 in the government reached out to him to begin the preparations for negotiation, to establish dialogue, he was ready mm -hmm. and they were amazed. The negotiations weren't all that easy, so right no. until the end there were still problems with some parties not wanting to come in. Um, do you want to describe that a little yes, bit? Yes, I mean you remember the, mm -hmm. the run up to the, mm -hmm. the, during the negotiations there was the whole incident where the AWB invaded Boputatswana mm -hmm. and uh, sort of went in with shotguns just firing randomly at um, everybody they came across off the back of jeeps. Very vividly described in the book. In the book, it? yes. Yeah. And it was a decisive moment mm -hmm. when um, I think what happened was there was a confrontation with uh, some army units of mm -hmm. the, the local army or police perhaps. And um, there was a confrontation and some AWP people were in, uh, injured and fell out of the jeep and pleaded for mercy and they were just shot dead. Mm -hmm live on television and I think that was that was the first time that had happened where a white had been dealt with in that mm. summary way. I think it was a big shock to the white community but still it was right up until the last. I mean I remember arriving as a parliamentary observer from the British Parliament, somebody <laughs> involved in the anti-apartheid <laughs> struggle, brought up in Pretoria, my parents South African born, then to go back to view these elections mm. was a remarkable experience. Mm. But the day we arrived, I had to walk to our hotel through wreckage from a bomb blast that had gone off uh, in the centre of Johannesburg. So there was still, right to the end, attempts to wreck the process. And people, looking back on Mandela now, mm -hmm. uh, there's a, a certain tendency amongst young militants especially to say he was too soft. Actually, he was as mm -hmm. tough as anything. And uh, he negotiated a very hard bargain mm -hmm with the, the ruling white elite. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course it paved the way for the new mm -hmm. democracy that we have now mm -hmm. for all its imperfections mm -hmm. and all the lack of uh, change in some respects that there's been, to me is like night and day compared with the old apartheid mm -hmm. system. Absolutely, um, uh, yeah, let's, let's stay with that. And, and look at the system today. Do you think uh, Mandela reached a point towards the end of his life where he became worried that his dream, his legacy would fall apart? Yes, because even, I think, I, I quote in the book, mm -hmm. a year or so before he stood down as president, he was already warning uh, the ANC and in public about the dangers of creeping mm -hmm. corruption. Now that, read, that reached an institutionalized uh, seismic level mm -hmm. under President Zuma where corruption was just rampant and organized from the presidency mm -hmm. together with the Gupta brothers mm -hmm. and their cronies and the complete uh, infection of the state with cronyism as well as corruption, people literally looting the place, uh, is something that in his latter years Mandela was absolutely hated. Uh, and had warned about and uh, it was against all of his values of integrity for example he uh, devoted a proportion of his salary to the Nelson Mandela Children's Fund when he was president to establish it the charity that he set up you can't imagine President Zuma ever having done that um, and his values of integrity and social justice and equality and human rights and democracy and media freedom as well. Those were some things, even when the media were criticizing the ANC or maybe even criticizing him, he fought to the end to say media freedom is absolutely vital to a healthy mm -hmm. democracy. Mm -hmm. Now in the book you also outlined you, uh, the, the number of things that, that the um, ANC government managed to achieve in the period that they have been um, in power. You've also listed the corruption, the, the things that have gone wrong. Um, do you think now with a new leadership we could return back to the values of Mandela? 
Well, yes, as you say, in the final chapter, it is entitled Legacy Betrayed? Question mark, where I address that question. And it has, the ANC has achieved a lot. You know, there are, there's a lot of dissatisfaction and impatience amongst young people. I understand that. If I were a young, especially black South African, I would identify and feel that as well. But, you know, there have been 400,000 extra black students at universities since the ANC came to power and a lot of other achievements. So a lot has been done, not enough. But I think under Cyril Ramaphosa, who is in the Mandela tradition, who was the person Mandela would have preferred to succeed him rather than Thabo Mbeki, that's an established fact which I report in the book. Um, I think that heritage can be reclaimed and he's trying to do it and he has my support and I think he should have everybody's support. But it's a tough job. And as I've already seen, there's a sort of the Ramaphoria has ended. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, people expect too much too quickly. This cancer of corruption and cronyism is like cancer in the human body. Once it's in the system, mm -hmm. it's really hard to get out. So in my view, South Africa will only succeed, have a growing economy, create full employment and opportunities for all, if the Mandela legacy is reclaimed. Mm -hmm. And the born free generation, you also talk about them, you said earlier that, um, that they're dissatisfied, they don't have jobs and so on. But do you also have faith in them to, to take the country forward? Well, I I'm a visiting professor at Wits Business School, have been now for a couple of years, and I really enjoy it. And they're young uh, South Africans, a majority are black South Africans in the classes that I teach, and they're incredibly talented. And I think there's all this energy and, and ability waiting to be released, which is why you need good governance. Y you cannot create a buoyant economy and a, a strong society and a compassionate society that gives the chances to all unless you've got good governance. And I just want to add one other point. I was a minister in the Labour government, mainly turned to Tony Blair and then Gordon Brown, and we achieved an amazing amount. I put the Iraq war in a separate box. Mm -hmm. I mean, clearly that was totally the wrong thing to do, and history has shown that. But we achieved an amazing amount in terms of improving health and schooling, schools and housing and all those basic things. But it was really hard, and that's in a British system. In the South African system, with the dreadful dead weight of uh, the apartheid legacy with its deliberate policy of ensuring the black majority did not get the, s the education and the skills they needed, deliberately keeping them down. It's even harder. So don't expect Sir Ramaphosa to achieve overnight change. Don't expect you know, things to improve even next year, but keep pushing for it. Well, Tain, as we wrap up, um, in, a, in a nutshell, tell me what most impressed you. You knew Mandela personally, you knew him quite well. What most impressed you about him? His self-deprecation, his mischievousness in private, lots of stories in the book about that, but his iron integrity and his compassion and his, his, his interest in people. There are too many leaders in the world today, the Trumps, the Putins, the rest of them, who are only interested in themselves. Nelson Nelson Mandela was uh, interested in the people and ruled for the people, and that's why it was such a privilege to write the book. And it's really the only short, accessible, readable book about him. Uh, and I hope that especially the young generation of South Africans might have an opportunity to read it, to understand their heritage and to take it forward. Thank you so much for coming in and chatting pleasure. with us Thank about you. this. And uh, my guest today is Peter Hain, and the book is Mandela, His Essential Life. That brings us to the end of this edition of Talking Books. Thanks for watching.